executive director. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we are uh, have most of our advisory members here. Um, oh, thank you. I would be talking on mute. This is why Josh is here to remind me of these things. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> welcome everybody to today's advisory uh, the committee meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, we uh, were here last in February when it was very much winter out there. It is spring now, and I see there are some buds on the trees, but it's still really cold, so I'm hoping that it'll feel like spring pretty soon. Um, what I thought we would do first uh, before I give you an overview of the agenda and some updates is to go around the room. We have some newer faces. Um, last time when we met, we talked about um, you know, int everyone introduced themselves and said why they were here and why they wanted to be on the advisory. I, I'll, um, I'll have you just go around and just introduce yourself and let uh, folks know who you're affiliated with or um, if you're a private citizen, that's great too. I know we have a member here that was not here last time, so when we get over to that side of the table, I'll, I'll have her talk a little bit about her background if, if she can do that for us today. So I um, am Susan Barrett, as everyone knows. I am the executive director of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm delighted to see all of you today. Sarah Kinsler, I'm a, a director of strategy and operations at the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, Rick Dooley, clinical network director for uh, Health First, the Independent Practice Association. Uh, I'm Sam Liss, I'm chairperson of the Statewide Independent Living Council, um, among other titles. Bob Big, CEO of the Howard Center. I'm Jason Garbarino. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Nursing at UVM. Andy Miller, pharmacist with Brattleboro Pharmacy. <coughs> David Sickle, private citizen, but uh, I recently retired after 30 years at Vermont League of Cities and Towns working on health and other insurance programs. Marguerite Monet, I'm a social worker at the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont. I'm Jeff McKee. I'm the VP for Community and Behavioral Health at Welland Regional Medical Center. I'm Sharon Gutwin, a physical therapist and a business owner of the rehab gym. I'm Jim Yulegar. I'm a family physician and VP at the University of Vermont Medical Group. Allison Ibrahimi Gold. I'm a registered nurse at Kingdom Internal Medicine. I'm Kristen Murphy from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. I'm not a member. I'm here to support our member who will introduce herself. I'm Terry Olden. Um, I wear a lot of hats. Um, I'm from Lamoille County, which is north of Mount Mansfield. I have a son with a developmental disability, and he's also insulin dependent, diabetic. I have a um, I have MS, so I'm on a road that is going to be dependent on medical care. And I'm a farmer with a fallow farm, and someday I'll have time enough to put it back on its feet and get going again. Okay. Uh, I'm Micah Demers. I work in uh, quality improvement at Blue Cross. Mark Nunless, family physician, formerly of White River Family Practice. Josh Clavin, primary care physician, uh, CMO at Blue Cross. Gail Claire, RM, and CEO of Little Rivers Healthcare in Bradford. Kevin Mullen from the board. Tom Fallon from the board. Jessica Holmes from the board. Robin Lange also from the board. And Eli on the phone, could you just introduce Walter yourself? Sorry? Walter. And Walter. Oh, wait, Eli, hold on a second. In the room. Walter Carpenter, Vermont Healthcare for All, citizen activist and Green Mountain Care Board Healthcare Groupie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Kathy Mahoney, I'm uh, the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Bay State Health in uh, Massachusetts, but I live in, in Ludlow, Vermont. Um, and my interests are in uh, quality and patient safety and uh, how those, the intersection of those things uh, directly impact the cost of care um, that we provide our, our citizens. And Eli on the phone. Yep, I'm Eli Lester Goldsmith. I'm a small business owner in South Burlington, Vermont. I'm on the advisory uh, committee um, and I'm just looking to um, be a helpful part of the committee. Thanks. Great. Well, welcome all. 
Uh, today, um, we have a very busy agenda, so I will be very brief, but I wanted to walk you through our agenda, and I have no idea which way to, ah, to get it out. Um, so, after I walk you through the agenda, I'll give you a brief update on the work that the board has been doing since February. Um, so today, we are going to have my updates, and then we're going to finalize the draft charter. Um, we incorporated the, some of the changes that you asked from the last meeting. <coughs> then we'll hear an update and an overview on the all-payer model and ACO. We have staff from the Green Mountain Care Board who will give you that overview. Then we're going to break out into different groups. We sent you the information on the three different groups, and I'm, I'm just going to briefly give you a little bit of background on that. Um, I think it was David who brought up the open meeting law last meeting. Thank you. Then our lawyers took that and ran with it. <laughs> Here we are today. Um, so you all, if you want to communicate outside of a public meeting, you cannot be in a group that's larger than seven. That would be considered a quorum. So in order for you to take a discussion offline uh, or online, uh, you need to be within a, that group of seven. So what we did is we, it's actually, it works out well because it's, it serves twofold. One, it allows us to abide by the open meeting law, which is very important. And two, for today's meeting, what we're going to do is break you out into those groups. We've given some scenarios and some questions around some topics um, that I can go over in a minute. But um, we're going to ask you to give the board ad advice on those issues. And, um, and I think that's the primary goal for you guys is to advise the board. So it's, it's actually a nice way um, to, to kill two birds with one stone. The three topics that we're looking at are actually uh, the result of a doodle poll that we um, performed with the group. And they're also aligned really well with the top three priorities that the board has for this year. So they are the all pair model and accountable care organization, healthcare workforce, and price transparency. Or actually, let me back up. It's transparency in general, including price transparency. So, um, any questions before I move on to the updates? Great. And everyone got the packet of information beforehand. If, if you need hard copies, they're on the table behind me. So this is a bit of a busy slide, and I don't have a pointer, so I'm actually going to go up here and point to you. So what has the board been up to since we met last? And some updates. So. This is a slide depicting rural hospitals. Um, as many of you know, uh, as many of you know, we've had um, some recent troubles here in Vermont, specifically around Springfield Hospital. And what the board has done, uh, I believe it was in April, is among other things, uh, we convened a panel to discuss challenges and opportunities for rural hospitals. We had an expert, a uh, national expert, who um, just did a, a great presentation. I believe um, we sent that presentation and the link to you. I, I know everyone's busy, but if you do have time, take a look at it. It was very dynamic and very informative. Then we also had um, CEOs from a couple of our hospitals uh, on the panel. And the takeaway from the panel was two things. The national expert said obviously there are challenges but what we're doing in Vermont around the all-payer model and moving away from fee-for-service towards population-based payments is the way to go and that was heartening but the thing he also said is that it's a really hard time for folks who are trying to do that because you're you're in the proverbial two canoes or is it the dock and the canoe I can't remember what it is um, and that's really where we are right now. It's a very challenging time. Um, but we've also incorporated into our hospital budget guidance some additional measures um, related to oversight of hospitals and getting more information um, on, their, on their finances so that we can keep a, an eye on these hospitals and also find ways to support them. I don't know if Board member Lunch would like to add anything and put you on the spot, but she was actually integral in putting that panel together. 
Sure, I'll just chime in briefly. Um, I think it, what was helpful for me was to really get more of a national perspective because I think it's very easy to be focused on what we're doing here and how's it going and all those sorts of things, but really understanding that the dynamics around payment reform are really national and they're being driven by Medicare and so that's something that we all have to understand um, when thinking about moving forward here in Vermont. Um, the other piece I think uh, that's important to note is there is a bill going through the legislature to establish a rural health task force. Um, and I think right now what we're doing is waiting to see kind of how that comes out of the legislature and um, then that would be the follow-up to our meeting and kind of the next step in looking at rural hospital issues and what's happening in that area. And it did, it hasn't been signed by the governor, but it ha passed mm -hmm. with chamber, so. Um, this is DC, if you can tell. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna ask Chair Mullen if he could describe or update the, the committee on his recent trip to Washington. It really wasn't that recent. Really? Yeah, when you think about it, it Time was the end of March. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, Governor Scott, um, Secretary Gobey, uh, Ina Backus, and I traveled to uh, Washington to meet with the new director at the Center for uh, Innovation at uh, the HHS facility. And it was uh, really a fascinating discussion because what you continually hear about is how government is broken. And this was a case where we went to discuss an agreement that was signed under the Shumlin administration with the Obama administration in Washington, and yet here we are with the Trump administration and the Scott administration, and everybody's still working towards uh, fulfilling um, what what uh, everyone sees as the future of medicine, which is moving away from fee-for-service. And the good news was um, we felt home right away when um, Deputy Director uh, Bowler talked about how we love Vermont and uh, makes frequent ski trips up here. So uh, that was a, a very good thing. And uh, I think that the governor definitely walked away from there with a, a much better understanding and as did our Washington partners and it, it's nice to hear when the governor's out making speeches. I know I was in Rutland I guess two weeks ago for the groundbreaking of the the Huber building which they're calling the Hube. <laughs> the governor was talking about the uh, move to the Alpair models. So that's a very good thing. So I think that uh, it was refreshing just to see that despite changes in administrations, everybody's still moving forward. Thank you very much for that update. Um, I have a couple of more. The picture in the middle is uh, the picture of a recent report that I believe was also sent to all of you. It is, I don't know how many pages, 180, it's a lot of pages. 600 something. Oh, it's more than that, okay. <laughs> Clearly, I, I, I will say I did not read the whole thing. Executive <laughs> summaries are wonderful. Um, but this is a document that came out in April, and um, it is a, a federal evaluation of the state innovation models. So um, the state in innovation models were was a program that Vermont participated in, gosh, four or five years ago, it was a $45 million grant that we received from the CMMI, which is the Innovation Center of CMS. Um, there are many people in this room who worked on SIM, either worked, like Sarah sitting next to me, I don't mean to embarrass you, Sarah, but she was working on the SIM team, I know there are others, but then there are many of you who actually worked tirelessly in the stakeholder groups and um, uh, suffice it to say, um, and I don't like to read off slides, but I'm just going to read what they said uh, in this evaluation. They looked at the six uh, round one states. Um, first, Vermont um, saved, yielded a savings of $97 million in Medicaid over the three years, and relative to saving in the comparison group. 
And Vermont had a statistically significant slower increase in total Medicaid expenditures. Vermont showed comparatively lower rates of ED visits and inpatient admissions. And then this is a quote from the report. Overall, Vermont's SIM initiative was a catalyst in terms of advancing alternative payment methods and innovative delivery models focused on paying for value and quality rather than volume. Many especially recognize the importance and influence of the SIM initiative for promoting alignment, coordination, and communication across state agencies, delivery and payment models, stakeholder communities, and other state initiatives. While a solid foundation of health reform initiatives existed in the state, the SIM initiative was a valuable driver of funding major activities that accelerated the models forward. Strong stakeholder engagement and invested providers who were supported through innovation grants and learning collaboratives were key to Vermont's success. Although still in its early implementation phase, Vermont's all-payer ACO model, which has developed under and informed by the SIM initiative, is expected to continue the momentum of payment and delivery model reform across the state. So it was an excellent evaluation from the federal government. And um, I want to thank all of you who participated and then the folks also who worked tirelessly on that. Um, the last thing I just want to mention to sum up, and Robin um, talked a little bit about this earlier. We've been at the legislature for the last, since January, so five months, four months. I want to point out to you that <coughs> this is actually Kevin in the witness chair. I don't know if you can see that far. I am right here. You can see my hair. But it, we have been uh, working with the legislature throughout the session and fingers crossed, I think they're going home on Saturday. Um, but uh, so there are, there are bills that are still working their course through the legislature, but two bills I wanted to highlight that are pretty much done. Robin alluded to the health care task force bill. Um, that has uh, has not been signed by the governor yet, but that will the board uh, the board as well as many other stakeholders will be involved in looking at uh, the rural health care in the state of Vermont and then reporting that back to the legislature in January, and then another bill that um, is is quite an accomplishment I think, um, and I, I have a, a a phone a friend here who may have a couple of highlights for you. Um, is the primary care spend bill. Um, this is something that the board has been looking at um, on its own through the all-payer model, but the legislature wants um, some reporting back to it for next year's session. Michelle De Degree, I must have called you by your wrong name, Michelle Degree, who is a health policy advisor here at the board, will be shepherding the work um, on this this bill, and if, do you want to have a, a high-level overview of the bill? You don't have to get into the weeds. Sure. Uh, so do, it's. Do you want to see? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, it's really bright. I will just. Um, I had my eyes dilated this morning, so I might have to put my sunglasses on at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's in concert with DIVA. So it's the Green Mountain Care Board and the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, and so the, it's kind of directing us to report back to the legislature on January 15th of this coming year um, on a variety of things. Um, most importantly is sort of developing what we think is an appropriate primary care spend measure. And as Susan alluded to, we already have a few versions of that that the board already uses, but this directs us to kind of work with some more um, advisory groups and get some feedback on that. Um, and then, so we're gonna look at the proportion that's spent across a variety of sectors and submit that to the legislature and then also determine um, sort of future implications. So if this, then what might happen? You know, if we were to say all commercial insurers up to X percent, then what might those implications be down the road? Um, so there's a lot of forecasting, but also a lot of current state. And that's what we'll be working on. I'll be working on. That will be Michelle Summer. <laughs> over the summer. Um, but I also want to highlight this too. There may be folks on this committee we reach out to um, as we prepare the report for the legislature. I think there's a few primary care providers in this in this group. So um, thank you. Um, oh, I should. Mention, it's oh. also Act 17 now. Oh right, it has been signed by the governor, so it's, it's Act 17. Thank you. Um, so I am going to turn it over to <coughs> Mark.
Melissa Miles, who's a healthcare project, project director at the board, uh, who came in a little late um, because she was getting a piece of material for me, not because she was late, and then Sarah Kinsler, who you met earlier, to give you an overview of the all four model. And you know what I just realized? Um, why don't you guys go and then we'll do the charter afterwards because I didn't see the copy of the charter. So sure. I think that makes sense. Okay. Sure. <coughs> All right. Um, again, I'm Sarah Kinsler, Director of Strategy and Operations of Board. This is Melissa Miles. Health Policy Project Director. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, just to, before we really dig into the all pair ECO model, um, we want to put that in context. Um, so to do that, I'm going to start with, by reading a quote from the board's decision to sign the all pair model agreement in 2016. Um, the rise in cost of healthcare imposes unsustainable financial burdens on Vermonters and their families, impedes equitable access to preventive care, and threatens to cripple our state's economy. Left unchecked and uncontrolled, it will prevent Vermont from reaching its goal to ensure that all of its citizens have access to affordable, high quality health care. So to couple this with data, <coughs> this slide is really just showing, um, it's showing data from Vermont's healthcare expenditure analysis, which we've been doing um, since the mid 1990s to track Vermont's healthcare spending. Um, and in 2017, the most recent year for which data is available, Vermont healthcare spending grew 1.7%. Um, healthcare is also growing faster than our economy in general. Um, the healthcare share of Vermont's gross state product has risen, risen precipitously over the past 20 years, as has healthcare as a percent of national GDP. So if the blue line is Vermont, red line is national. There's actually some good news on that slide because if you look at the most recent trend, it's the lowest spread between the two lines. And recent history, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I should say, um, Kevin has presented similar versions of these slides. <laughs> um, Chair Mellon has presented similar versions of these slides over the past few weeks and months. So if anyone's heard Kevin present on the all-pair model recently, you might be getting a little bit of a review. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, you can chime in uh, if you have additions for us. Um, so despite our high spending, health outcomes must also improve. Um, even though Vermont's consistently ranked one of the healthiest states in the nation, um, chronic disease, suicide, and drug overdose take a huge toll, toll on Vermont and Vermonters. Um, chronic diseases are the most common cause of death in Vermont. Um, in 2014, the, year for which, uh, the most recent year for which data is available, 78% um, of Vermont deaths um, were caused by chronic diseases. Um, and Vermont's death rates from suicide and drug overdose are higher than the national average. So to address the issues that Sarah has just laid out, the legislature gave Vermont permission to enter into an agreement with the federal government back in 2015, as long as it met specific terms, which were outlined by, under the Golden Dome over there, by House Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare, um, and the act is called Act 113. So the criteria that the legislature wanted in the agreement and can be found in the agreement includes things like predictable population-based payments and alignment of payer programs and population health outcome measures, um, utilization of local community collaboratives. These were all priorities for both the community and the legislature at the time. So the all pair model was signed in 2016, went into effect in 2017, and our performance period is 2018 to 2022, so we're in performance year one. But basically, the premise of the l model, as it's outlined up there, is if we move away from fee-for-service to value-based payments that are tied to quality and also increase investments in primary care, will we be able to accelerate the care delivery transformation and improve health outcomes while also slowing the growth of healthcare costs in Vermont? So that is our logic model that we, our touchstone that we go back to. Okay. So, Basically, how are we doing this? What is the all pair model? Um, it was built on the chassis of an accountable care organization, which was a program started by Medicare, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which provided a way for providers to contract with each other to work together to increase quality while decreasing the cost of care. So Medicare has grown their ACO model into something called the Next Generation Program, which over time, Medicare is looking for providers to take on more risk and be more accountable for the total cost of care for their patients. So the all pair model uses the ACO to, um, you know, it's given us the flexibility to, to design our own Next Generation ACO model. 
and with Vermont specific modifications that reflect our population and our healthcare delivery system. And it's also allowed closer alignment of commercial and Medicaid programs that are risk-based that the ACO has. Um, it's also allowed us to continue funding from the federal government that was otherwise going to go away um, for community innovations like the blueprint per member per month payments for Medicare patients and also the SASH dollars. Um, so this slide really gives you a, a high-level overview of Vermont's responsibilities under the all-payer model agreement. Um, in the box on the left, um, you'll see that the agreement includes cost and quality targets. Um, the cost for targets require Vermont to limit spending growth for certain services, um, both for Medicare patients and then in a separate target for all-payer beneficiaries, in, in quotes there, um, which really includes most Vermonters. Um, with respect to quality, the state is responsible for meeting um, targets on 20 different quality measures, um, including, um, including three statewide population health goals, and we'll talk about that uh, quite a bit more in the next slide. Um, moving to the box on the right, um, the state's also uh, responsible for ensuring that ACO programs um, in Vermont are aligned on some key uh, areas, including um, attribution, so how we, how we know who is a member of the ACO, um, the services for which the ACO is held financially accountable, um, quality measures, um, and then the, the payment mechanisms and risk arrangements um, that are part of the, the ACO's financial arrangements. Um, finally, the all pair model uh, signatories are responsible for steadily increasing the scale of the model, so how many people in Vermont um, are ACO members. Um, and that is something that will happen as more payers and providers decide to contract with the ACO. Um, both the scale and alignment pieces are aiming to, um, to maximize the benefits of the multi-payer aspects of this model, so by aligning um, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers, and then ensuring that their programs are similar enough. We give providers some strong, um, strong common incentives that are moving in one direction. You've been muted. Um, <laughs> Unmute yourself, Chris. <laughs> Darn. Six. The phone you is are not. no longer muted. <laughs> <laughs> the phone is again interested in this presentation. <laughs> So multi-payer alignment on things like quality measurement also supports decreased provider burden, which is um, a, a significant interest of the board and of the legislature in Act 113. So now, um, if there are questions on the quality framework, I'm, I'm hoping to pitch them over to Michelle Degree, who's our quality queen and getting a lot of shout outs today. But I'm actually gonna start from the bottom of the pyramid here and work our way up. So um, as I briefly mentioned before, um, the all-payer model agreement is tied to these three um, population health outcome goals um, that were selected based on, you know, way back as the agreement was being negotiated based on Vermont's state health improvement plan. Um, so these are statewide measures and targets related to the health of the population regardless of whether um, individuals seek care or not. Um, the population generally includes all Vermonters, and these, these measures are part of what makes Vermont's all-payer model unique. Um, around the time that this agreement was being signed, we were not seeing other states sign on to, to you know, <coughs> improve chronic disease measures, for example, to, to you know, reduce the prevalence of diabetes in their state. Um, and here in our all-payer model, those are really um, not just um, part of the quality framework, but they're, they, they provide the structure for the whole quality framework. So as we move up, kind of up the pyramid, I'll give examples of measures, um, well, and I'll focus specifically on reducing deaths related to drug overdose. Um, so healthcare delivery system quality measures and targets are measures and targets evaluating ACO performance and quality of care. And for these measures, the population is the ACO population. Um, measures can either be um, uh, across payers um, or payer specific. And an example here um, is initiation of alcohol and other drug dependence treatment. And then for the process milestones at the top of the pyramid, um, those are measures that ensure that the state and the ACO are striving to improve quality and population health and an example there would be um, the rate of adults in Vermont who are accessing uh, medication-assisted treatment for um, drug, drug abuse. Um, <coughs> so now Melissa's gonna switch over to talking a little bit about the board's specific responsibilities under the model. You are no longer using <laughs> <laughs> it. Right? Yeah, of <laughs> Okay, so this slide has the Green Mountain Care Board's two main goals to reduce the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures and ensure and improve the quality of and access to care. And 
as you'll see under that, there are a variety of um, regulatory levers that the board is able to use and is working toward integrating um, to meet these goals and to achieve the goals of the all-pair model. So I'm going to do a deep dive into the regulatory duties under Act 113 of the ACO certification, ACO budget review, and I'll, t I'll touch on the ACO program design. But you know, as you also see, we have the hospital budget review, the health insurance rate review, and the certificate of need. So, um, in absence of time, I will keep moving on to stay on ACO specific stuff. So the ACO certification um, in Act 113 of 2016, there were about 10 areas of focus for the board to look at. And so they are all listed on the left-hand side there. So composition of governing body, leadership and management, solvency, the provider network. And so in the beginning of 2018, the board did a very detailed review of this to examine the areas of the ACO. Um, we looked at their governance structure, their population health management and care coordination program, their patient protections, performance evaluation, and, and so on. It was quite a detailed review. And so within each area, then we looked for additional criteria, and I thought an example might be helpful here. So you know, ACOs have a large focus on care coordination and enhancing community provider communication to ensure that patients are getting the right care in the right place. Um, so we looked to see how this is being performed in collaboration with the Blueprint for Health, uh, as was required by Act 113, and the local community collaboratives and community health teams. So, you know, this is a vehicle that the legislature has thus far used to um, add additional certification requirements. And so in 2018, the legislature added the review of mental health programs and childhood adversity and how, um, how the ACO is addressing those and wanted us to take an additional look at provider payments. So we reviewed those at the end of 2018. So we had quite a bit of certification review in 2018, um, and now we're receiving and reviewing on an ongoing basis any updated policies and procedures that OneCare has, um, and do that through a quarterly monitoring process. So secondly, Act 113 gave us the authority to review the ACO's budget. And this is an annual budget review, and it includes a look at their budget and their planned revenue, um, we also look at their payer contracts. We look at how they're mitigating risk among the different programs um, and how their different payer programs with commercial um, Medicare and Medicaid align according to the requirements of the agreement. Um, we also look at scale and, and if the ACO is growing and in, in, in what lines of business or what areas of the state they're growing in. And so. Um, as it says up there, so for the 2019 performance year, the ACO provided the board with an estimated budget of about $850 million um, with a projection of 196,000 lives. Those are still being settled and they're coming in to present to us in June to give us the final numbers because attribution takes a while to run. But it should also be recognized that a majority of those dollars are passed through from the ACO to, the, to providers and they're turning them into prospective payments for population health programs and care coordination payments. So the board writes a budget order every year uh, with conditions that the ACO needs to meet and those can be found on our website from 2018 and 2019. I think I do the next one too. I think you do. <laughs> but I just it. You're right. <laughs> so this is where we have the flexibility with Medicare to design our own next generation ACO program. Um, and simply put, it allows us to set uh, the financial target for the ACO for their Medicare attributed lives and also allows us to make any operational changes that would align the Medicare program closely to the state and the state's priorities for Medicaid and commercial. So for example, the board worked last year to set the 2019 quality framework for Medicare and the Medicare program. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview, and it doesn't look that quick, I guess, uh, <laughs> to, I think to staff at least, um, on the reporting that we're required to do under the all care model. So that, um, in, in signing the agreement, um, CMMI uh, did not just say, and we trust you to you know, improve quality um, and control cost. Um, we're doing a very significant amount of reporting um, to help them understand um, what we're doing and how we're, how, what we are doing, how we're doing it, and how we're performing over the course of the model. So um, 
you'll notice that year two, um, which we're, we're early in year two right now, um, includes, uh, it's, a, it's a big year for our reporting and particularly um, for the re recurring uh, reports and analytics that we're starting to produce. Um, so we've only listed those once. Um, but the recurring reports include um, our quarterly total cost of care reporting, um, which began earlier this year um, and will continue quarterly for the duration of the agreement. Um, so these reports come out about nine months after the quarter during which um, an individual might receive care. Um, so our first report, including a full year of data, won't be produced until September for the 2018 performance year, I should say. Um, in addition, uh, we did our first annual payer differential report, um, which measures the percent of ACO benchmarks, um, or sorry, the percent ACO benchmarks increased by payer, um, and we'll be doing that annually as well. Um, and then we'll also report annually on scale um, and alignment, so the number of, uh, <coughs> of Vermonters participating in the model and how the, the different payers' models are uh, different or similar to one another um, annually and doing annual quality reporting. In addition to this, um, Vermont's going to produce a handful of kind of more, more one-off reports um, on particular topics, including um, additional reports on, on various aspects of the payer differential, um, a public health system accountability framework, which will be led by the Agency of Human Services, um, and a plan to integrate Medicaid mental health substance use disorder and home community-based services um, within the all-payer um, financial targets um, that are included in the model. And again, that will be led by the Agency of Human Services. So we have a lot of work to do on analytics and reporting over the next few years. Um, okay, so this is progress to date. Where are we as we head into performance year two of the model? Um, so the ACO is one pair of Vermont. We have one ACO operating in Vermont. <laughs> And um, they have contracts with Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross um, Blue Shield of Vermont, the QHP program. And um, they have a contract for their self-insured employees at UVMMC. So we have found that these contracts are largely aligned. Um, and this intention, once again, is to reduce burden for providers and just hopefully streamline things <laughs> in, in these risk-based programs. Um, so, you know, I will say that we're starting to see and hear that the payment changes are providing some flexibility for providers to develop local transformations in their clinics or in their communities. Um, we had a reports from the field presentation uh, board meeting back in February and providers were saying, yeah, I was able to hire more care coordinators or I was able to embed a mental health clinicians in my practice with some of this increased funding and flexibility. Um, so that is a hopeful sign toward progress, in my opinion. Um, so we have 12 of Vermont's 14 hospitals participating in a one least, at least one pair program. And we're still, as I said, settling out the final attribution for 2019. And these maps just show um, performance year zero. From, um, one care had a contract with Medicaid for a next generation program. And they were in four communities in Vermont. So then performance year one was 2018, and that included an addition of a Medicare contract and Blue Cross and Blue Shield, a Vermont contract and the UVMMC contract. And then performance year two shows where there is at least one, um, where the community is participating in at least one risk-based program. Um, Medicaid has been the leader for communities to, to jump into. That's what we've seen thus far. And then at the bottom um, are all the different types of participating providers. And that's it. Great. So I'm looking at the time. Um, it's 2.40. And I just want to make sure we have enough time to do our breakout groups. And we want to finalize the charter, which should be quick. Um, I can open it up to questions. Um, either. Melissa or Sarah or for the board. Does anyone have questions? Wow, that's great. Maybe, I think that's a good sign. I hope. Is there a strategy towards achieving the scale model target? Oh, that's Sorry. a good that's a question. question. Well, I've got a little, got my little cheat sheet of who's, <laughs> with whom in terms of cross, making Medicare, et cetera. And then self-funded, of course, is a big, area we need to chip away at. Yes, we are working on that. Um, we have a scale uh, report due at the end of June to the federal government. Um, 
I don't know, I don't know if the board members want to add anything else. Um, one of the things I would add is in the ACO budget process, one of the areas that we often explore with them is their strategy for scale. Um, and so that we can kind of get a sense of how they're looking at it. They're, because there's a number of different ways that reasonable people could approach it, of course. You could do a payer approach, you could do a provider approach. You probably want to do a little mix of both. And as you mentioned, for self-insured employers where we have no regulatory levers, uh, that really has to be a private sector approach. Um, so we certainly, that's a question that we've been asking and promoting as well as certainly doing our own internal uh, thinking about, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to I guess I would just say that we, there's a small group of us trying to think about strategy um, and, and with respect to a lot of these uh, folks who may or may not be already in the model and how do we change attribution methodologies, how do we reach some of those self-insured populations. Um, so I think it's an ongoing process and I think we're trying, you know, we welcome feedback from anybody here who can help us think through what are some of the mechanisms and levers and ways that we can encourage people to want to be a part of this model. So. What has been successful has been the Medicaid population. Mm -hmm. It's the other two populations that are a little bit more elusive. It's the commercial right. and the Medicare. And so we definitely, uh, <coughs> the good news is there doesn't seem to be any panic from Washington at this point because the take up between performance year one and two is very good, but we're still behind. Um, and remember, that's because we started way behind. Yeah, and Medicaid got a year start on the other, yep. head start on the other programs. Was there a question? They just had a quick question yeah. about the, the numbers. You had mentioned the um, self-insured population. What what percentage of Vermonters would that apply to? Oh, a big percentage, uh, yeah. actually. It's, it's, it's the it's majority of the commercially insured or insured population. Um, it's about a third of Vermonters, maybe a little bit more. We don't have authority over them. Sam, um, how, how closely aligned um, is it, are, are um, the, the 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 strategy, the targets with the you know the Medicaid pathway project mm -hmm. that's sort of dissipated, but um, like the mental health and, mm -hmm. and the substance abuse targets and strategies. So how closely aligned is what's rolling out now with that dissolved? Um, Medicaid pathways. I'll start, and I think there, there are folks who can add. Um, as I understand it, that is not dissolved. It just has a new name, which escapes me at this point. But I do know that our partners at AHS are working, um, as Sarah mentioned, in 2021, 2020. Um, there needs to be a, a plan for integration of, of, of those other services. So um, it, the goal of this program is to have alignment. Um, so I, I, I think that they are just, they're, they're starting those, that plan right now. Um, you'll hear more, I believe in the legislature, they're asking for some reports out um, at the beginning of next year. Um, so you'll hear more from them. But I don't know. Do you want to add I would anything? What I would add about that is there was a, from the, as one of the people who negotiated the agreement with the federal government, we made a conscious decision to push to not include certain services yeah. in the financial target because the financial target is meant to be a cost containment device. And we thought that these are the types of services that we may need to invest more money in to improve outcomes and populations. And so if, if it's an area where investing more money is desirable, you actually don't want it to be under the financial cap. You want the efforts to be aligned programmatically. Um, the federal government, however, they're, they are obviously very far away from people delivering care on the ground in Vermont. And so one of their major tools in their federal programs are these financial targets as a way of basically getting people to play ball on the ground. But it's a pretty, you know, blunt instrument, to be frank. Um, and I haven't been involved, obviously, in the AHS work, work since I moved over to the board. Um, but I think that's, like, I'm, that's something that I'm sure that they're really thinking hard about is how to balance those two interests. 
And we are, we will be working in, cons the board will be working in consultation with AHS on this. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, as you think about the, the, one of the two primary charges, reducing the total cost of care for Vermonters, um, is there a sense that there is uh, any low hanging fruit, places to start? I would turn, the analytics is just now starting to be produced because as Sarah mentioned, it's nine months of claims lag. And so, um, you know, the analytics team is going to be able to start to dig into that and do some decomposition analysis. And so I think, you know, I, I can't speak to anything specifically right now, but mm -hmm. I know the ACO is looking at their data and identifying clinical priorities where they do feel like there could be areas of low-hanging fruit to reduce the total cost of care. But in general, we are a very low-cost state. In general, New England healthcare is lower cost than in other parts of the country, so. Um, and I think really this model is, it's a dispersed model because it's built off of the blueprint for health. So the decision making on which areas to tackle is really pushed down to the community level. The concept being like, People in Montpelier who sit on a regulatory board don't necessarily know the right clinical priority for a particular local area, and really putting that decision making and the data and information at, in the hands of that local group of people um, will result in better outcomes and, and, and just better thinking around the clinical piece. Now there are challenges to that, of course, because a dispersed model means that you'll have different priorities in different areas, you'll have different talents in different areas, and so you could get some, I think as we've seen in the blueprint, there are some very strong blueprint communities and there's some others that are less strong. Um, so that's kind of the, the downside of that approach, but I think because we as a state had proceeded that way with the blueprint, the legislature basically said we don't want to undo that, so ACO, you need to go work with the blueprint. You can use your analytics and your data and your tools to pass on, but you need to be able to work through the communities and through the blueprint as well. So I think it's hard for us to answer that mm -hmm. question because it is this kind of dispersed model, but we did hear some good stuff at our panel on um, lessons from the field and some of the examples people were talking about were reducing emergency room utilization and getting people more closely tied into their primary care um, and looking at ways to support people with mental health needs by embedding uh, either primary care in mental health or mental health in primary care. Um, so I think there's a lot of good stuff happening and we certainly heard some of that. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think in some ways the, the benefit of having it be dispersed is that you can actually, it's like every little community is almost like a little petri dish and there's some experimentation happening and to the extent that we learn from those across communities well, which has the best ROI or return for investments um, as communities are varying those healthcare reform investments, so I would say there's a lot to be learned. I think that we're also trying to understand <coughs> variation in cost of care across communities and understanding is it the delivery system, is it underlying health of that community, is it, you know, so how do we start to unpack some of that is what we're, what we're starting to do and our data analytics team is doing and I know that the ACO is doing as well. So, um, and to your point about uh, our lessons from the field, I don't know if, if folks are able to, you can go back in time, any of our board meetings are actually uh, archived on our website, and that's one to listen to if you're really curious to see how this is actually manifesting, how some changes are manifesting themselves throughout Vermont. I mean, I was struck by, you can start to see how the services are changing in hospitals as the, the payment system is changing, you're starting to see hospitals, here's an example that I, I often use and think about, um, palliative care. When I was on the board at Porter Hospital five or six years ago, palliative care was a service area that we were, uh, the board was being uh, challenged with thinking about whether it's something we should keep, right, because it's actually a revenue loser for a hospital. Um, now under the all-payer model and fixed payments, it's actually exactly what you want. You want you know, palliative care keeps, in some sense, care out of the hospital, but it keeps people, patients healthier and or, or quality of care higher at lower cost. And so now that that hospital is expanding their palliative care. So that was an example of, you know, care delivery system reform changes. And as Robin was saying, we're also seeing hospitals change uh, 
the folks that they're hiring, so more social workers embedded in, in emergency rooms, more integration across community uh, services, you know, integration with the hospital and the community uh, care providers, psych nurse practitioners now embedded in uh, primary care practices. Really fascinating ways, and the different ways in which each community is tackling some of the challenges in the local community using the resources they have at their disposal differently, and we can learn a lot from all that. So I think it was a good uh, presentation if folks want to go back and look at it. I we'll, think we'll make sure we send it out to the group. Yeah, interesting. I know we sent the rural panel out to the group, but we'll, we'll actually send both of them. And a uh, shout out to Orca Media, who is who volunteers and tapes our, our program. So. Um, okay, I am going to transition um, to the charter. Did everyone receive the April 2019 charter in their email? And if you, I'm seeing some nodding heads. I'm seeing some not nodding heads. Um, you know what we can do is I'm going to have um, this sent out to you again. And in the interest of time, I think we'll put this to the next meeting because I want to make sure that everyone sees it and is okay with it before we finalize it. We just, um, what we did is we took some of the comments that we heard from the last meeting and we incorporated it into the this new draft. So is that, does that work for everyone instead of trying to rush through that and I see some folks haven't had a chance to look at it so I'd rather do that. And this way we have enough time to do our breakout sessions. So um, you all should have received in your packet uh, a chart with the three groups. So we have group A, group B, and group C. Um, group A is going to be, is, has an, uh, a question about the all care model and the ACO. Group B has um, work on questions on healthcare workforce and group C on price transparency. Does anyone need a copy of this or does everyone have their questions? <coughs> uh, no, I, yes. I have the question. Um, yeah. My question is, uh, for Group C, the sort of the title is Price Transparency, which is a hot topic everyone's interested mm -hmm. in. The question is about Green Mountain Care Board mm -hmm. Transparency, which I think is not as robust a conversation mm -hmm. or, or something. It's not a hot topic. It's not a hot topic. I guess we're so so, so how, how wedded are you to uh, us really discussing? Because your stuff's on yeah. the website. That's yeah. great. It's, we're much more interested in price transparency. Yeah, no. Please <laughs> okay. ex expand and, and provide your input. We, we're very much open to that. That's a great yeah. clarifying question. Um, so what I'm going to do is everyone's clear of their groups. Um, so Sarah is on her way back. She just had to take a bathroom break. Um, Michelle, can I just name up Michelle? Michelle is going to be helping out with Group B, the Healthcare Workforce Group, and this room is not great for How are we doing this? Orders I'm gonna, or? I was actually going to, do you think we'd be too loud in the hallway? Probably. Maybe we'll have one group, um, Michelle's group over here in this kind of entrance area. So that's Group B, Healthcare Workforce. James Illiger, Eli, who's on the phone. Um, will be participating. Terry Holden, Jason Garbino, Allison Evergreeny Gold, Trey, who's not here today, and Bob Beck. So that's workforce. And then um, Group A, it, um, Group C is Sarah Kinsler. So Sarah, why don't you take your group over in that corner? Um, Marguerite Monet, Andrew Miller, Kathy Mahoney, Samuel Samless. Sharon Gutwin, Rick Dooley, and Walter Carpenter. And while you're out, just so you know, um, there was a question on whether the topic could be a, um, expanded a bit to talk about price transparency. So, um, and then for the all pair model with Melissa Miles, um, I'm trying to think, I'm, I just don't want it to be so loud. Why doesn't that group go over there where the chair and Tom are? Did you say we were going to yes, take a quick break? Yep. Yeah, yeah, if you want to take a quick break, please do. Um, so we'll meet back, we'll convene back at 3.30. Work that you did today, you like this is not the transparency group. This is group, I think it was C, um, and group A is not always the all pair model group. I want to clarify that because I think it was a little confusing. So we'll have different topics uh, for each meeting. And certainly, please, uh, 
Send me a note or um, folks let us know if there's something in particular you would like to bring up. Um, as a breakout group, we, we are all ears. We're very transparent. <laughs> um, the second clarification piece uh, related to these groups is I had a consultation with our Associate General Counsel, Amarin, and she just wanted to stress to everybody two things, that when you're communicating within your group, you have to understand that you can't, your whatever, if, say you come up with a, an idea that you want the board to hear, you need to bring the idea here to a full board meeting and have, and talk about it here as opposed to emailing the board. Is that, did I get that right? And then the second part of um, the groups, the subgroups, is that just be aware that any communication that you have is open to um, being FOIA'd or in, and is open to open meeting law. So if you have any questions regarding that, just let me know. But I wanted to clarify those two points. So can I just ask you, so yeah. just logistically, so if someone in our group of seven has this issue that they're thinking, oh, this is really a burning issue, they sh it shouldn't be something that the seven of us are talking about, something that goes to you presumably for the next advisory committee to become a, a group about. Yeah, right. sure. If you have a burning, like, you're like, can we talk about this? You could send it to me, and, and I could talk with the chair and the board to see if we want to talk about it at another meeting. Another another meeting. But if there's something, you know, say you talked about, you had a great idea on transparency, you want to continue that conversation on your own within that those seven people, you can do that, <coughs> or any other topic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so I'm going to give you each six minutes to report out. I just want to make sure we get everybody in for um, the last time, uh, 20 minutes we have left. Um, so why don't I start with Group A on the Alpair model ACO. Okay. Um, and do you want to read the question yes. just so folks know? Uh, well, do you want me to just distill it? Uh, yeah, distill it would be we great. We were charged with determining the ideal state of health care and uh, who the partnerships and stakeholders should be for that. So, and please, the rest of the group jump in because I, I'm quite sure I missed a lot of it. <laughs> um, it distilling it down to, in terms of the, um, the elements of the ideal state would be um, basically accessible um, health care for all regardless of, without any barriers at all, which would include, you know, uh, in addition to transportation and cost, um, things like social determinants of health, behavioral health issues, uh, mental health issues. Um, so access to care without barriers, patient engagement, community involvement, aligned incentives um, for all participants, um, not just the payers and for the providers, um, infrastructure that supports the healthcare system, and stable funding. Um, so, um, and, and then in terms of the second question about um, who the partnerships um, and stakeholders should be, um, we look to the larger community, even going as far as state and national, but um, the, in addition to, pay, to, um, to provide care, which uh, obviously those are stakeholders, um, municipalities, schools, um, employers, and the patients themselves. Um, I anybody. Okay. And um, one comment that Dr. Nunlist um, made was, um, in terms of getting those stakeholders uh, to, number one, see themselves as stakeholders and then participate, is um, the fundamental piece to that is to get people to commit to a goal larger um, than themselves because they're, uh, for short term, if we're always looking at short term um, return or very narrow um, line item returns, we're not going to get there. Um, we need to look at the longer um, view and much bigger picture in terms of looking towards safer communities, um, savings in terms of um, special ed and um, corrections, looking way beyond the healthcare narrow budget. Um, any, I, I left out a lot of details, but. You have about four minutes left, so you have time. Oh, okay. Uh, do, do you wanna? Just to focus on the people who are the value uh, that are, that's derived by patients or monitors is, is one of the focus, and particularly outcomes that are important to them, rather than important to the payer or the provider. Um, 
So that was one kind of theme that I think I heard mm -hmm. pretty clearly. Yep. And Dr. Nunless. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one of the ways, a, a sort of shorthand way to think about what the healthcare ought to be like uh, is how many, how many of us feel that we get the care we want and need exactly when and how we want and need it. And that seems like an unattainable uh, goal, but it's not really if you break it down and start to, to, to work away at the edges. And that's really what would seem to be a superb healthcare system. And if we achieve that, I think the total cost of care would go down. And I'm pretty sure of that. Actually. Along the lines of access, we also you talked about things, um, uh, not only um, hours of, of availability and cost and transportation, but also um, some people just psychologically can't leave the home or Vermont roads <laughs> um, and home visits. Um, sometimes it might take um, something like that. Keeping in touch with patients in between visits and, and always having that lifeline and accessibility that way. Um, and then we had some, you guys missed the, yeah. you missed the wellness yeah. piece. So we had, we had also talked about uh, uh, the need to have a defined mechanism for transferring dollars yeah. into um, to, to address the uh, social determinants of health and just general community wellness. That we talk about this dollar shift from inpatient expensive care back into the community um, and the savings that will accrue in other parts of our AHS system, for example. But we haven't really defined any ways to move those dollars from one place where they currently exist, where people have ownership of them, um, to back into the community into these other types of investment opportunities. So we need to do more work on that. Well, that, that speaks to Dr. Nunnell's comment yeah. about that common goal and uh, bigger than ourselves. And then, I'm sorry. Oh, Dave. Dave. Um, we also talked a little bit about uh, wellness and, and the fact that the benefits of that really are far broader than just the health care system. Yet it's a health care system that you know, is associated with my insurer does this or, mm -hmm. or whatever when a lot of the benefits uh, from the, for example, for an employer are mm -hmm. having productive employees, being a desirable place to work, retaining employees. Those all have great value to employers, but it's the health system that's doing it, which often isn't very good at recognizing those things or even um, letting employers know that that's a value and that's added. I think that yes. 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 data, predictive oh, yeah, data, data. data. <laughs> being a way of getting yeah. toward mm -hmm. the, um, local yeah, those goals. Um, I'm also going to let folks know that we are taking notes on this and then we'll send this out to all of you and there might be other interested parties like the ACO who might want to read the notes and of course our board is here listening to this so okay am I allowed to contribute just an idea sure please as a consumer choice over myself and my classically autistic son, one thing that we desperately desperately need to navigate the maze of healthcare and developmental services we need a social worker. We talk about quality of life just to help us connect the dots so we don't waste so much time running down the wrong path in the maze, only to find out it wasn't the right thing to do, the right place to end up. And I don't know any other profession that could do that other than a social worker who connect the family to the community, to the health that keeps them in the community. Hallelujah. As a social worker, I have to admit I have a huge bias there. And no, I think that there's, there's studies that have proven over and over and over again, if you have case management, you have social workers connecting the people in the community to all the different, to the primary care, to specialty care, and looking at things like insurance, housing, nutrition, in all of those things, you get a much better outcome picture overall, for a lot cheaper too, by the way. <coughs> did, did everybody have a chance to take a look at the video link that was sent out? Which The one on the car, yeah. the analogy to getting your yeah. car fixed. Yeah. So those, I thought that was wonderful, yeah. and I look at many people, uh, we're talking about social work, but they're one of those folks mm -hmm. that coordinates the care, and so what we, what we need is to make sure all of those folks are represented, right? Mm -hmm. the, the exactly, folks, but we really need to see need like social mm -hmm. wear and, Cost, and case yeah. management services embedded into the healthcare system exactly. across the board. Exactly. Okay. 
Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Author, novel, ACO, discussion. So now I'm going to turn it over to the workforce. Oh, yes. Oh, the workforce is up here. Okay. Great. So I'm going to echo your comments that uh, group members please chime in for the, the pieces that I forget. Uh, our task was to talk about workforce shortages in Vermont, and we focused a lot about nursing. Um, with the current workforce, we're going to be short about 3,900 nurses in the next few years. Um, that said, and I don't want to forget, we also had some conversation about other professions. Um, the Howard Center included that's really struggling with getting the staff that they need to, to fill their vacancies. So some of the problems we talked about that we think lead or cause the problem of, of nurse shortage, um, our reentry program um, could see some improvement. We only have one reentry program in the state, and um, when I speak of reentry, I'm referring to professional um, nurses who leave the field, who leave the profession, and then want to rejoin the nursing profession and have to do some things to get their licensure up in place again, and that can be a struggle for nurses in our state. Uh, we find that there is not a lot of young nurses in the state. We have a lot of our nursing workforce um, entering retirement, and we don't have a young nursing workforce to, to replace those nurses. Uh, we recently had a closure of one of our nursing programs in the state in southern Vermont. Uh, fortunately, there's efforts to get the current students in place. I know at uh, UVM, where I teach, we're taking some of their students to help them finish their final years, but that's certainly um, a driver of getting some nurses in the southern part of our state available for employment. Uh, we find that not just nurses, but all healthcare professionals who move to the state, their spouses or their partners who uh, maybe aren't in healthcare. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong in what you were saying, and this is how I understood it, that um, their spouses are having trouble finding jobs. So there might be a nurse job or a physician job, but there's not jobs for their spouses in other fields. Uh, we had some conversation about pay disparity. A lot of nurses find that they will make more money going out of state. Um, a lot of my nursing students are interested in large metropolitan areas for a variety of reasons, but um, pay disparity is certainly one that's hard to fix, but is, is real. Um, I mentioned the topic of mentorship. Uh, in my years as a nurse, the patient census and acuity is just staggeringly going up. So nurses are experiencing burnout. Young nurses are experiencing burnout. Um, and we have to come up with some solutions to, to help them um, work through that. Mm -hmm. We talked about work environment, kind of goes along with that, but physical injuries, um, mental health concerns of, of nurses and other healthcare professionals needs to be addressed. Um, Nursing has the advantage of having a, a traveler system where we can get travelers in place, but many of our travelers don't have buy-in to the facilities and the organizations they work for, so um, that's, a, that's one of the main drawbacks that um, we've talked about with travelers, along with the cost. We mentioned it can be two to three times more expensive to have a traveler than to have a staff nurse. So some of the solutions that we talked about, uh, we talked about increasing educational opportunities for, um, for nurses. That could be degree programs. That could also be continuing education. <coughs> uh, we talked about how the all-payer model might um, help with that. New facilities in the state, the UVM Medical Center is opening the Miller Building. We think that could have some positive implications towards um, nursing environment and practice. Um, we also talked about shared governance of nurses, so getting them involved in making key decisions for, for institutions I think is really important. And um, I think the final thing I have written here is we talked about the advantages of programs like AHEC that can provide loan reimbursement for um, healthcare providers to work in rural areas, in areas where it's hard to recruit nurses such as mental health nursing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. Great, so there's two minutes, 18 seconds left on your clock. <laughs> Questions or comments or I, I, thank you for that input. Yeah, I just, yeah. it, it's a bit peripheral, but it is and it isn't because not only is there a nursing issue in the state, but I, I know, I hear all the time, there's a terrible shortage of psychiatrists yeah. in, in the state. And uh, it's, it's not only Vermont, it tends to be in all rural states, but nevertheless, um, and this is what I teach and, and I hear all the time. Um, one possible way to alleviate at least some aspects of that, and there have been bills in the last two sessions in the legislature, 
is to uh, follow a few states which have already done it, but bestow prescriptive privileges upon psychologists. And um, uh, it's just something to think about to alleviate, because th th in some cases, there are year-long waits for psychiatrists. And so this might, is it a perfect solution? No. But it does give prescriptive privileges to only doctor-level psychologists with considerable advanced training in psychopharmacology. So that might be something to consider to alleviate, which is a very real issue. Thank you for that. And I know Brattleboro Retreat has had success with telemedicine and recruiting psychiatrists who live in Brooklyn <laughs> and work at Brattleboro. So that's pretty cool stuff. Thing. In my area, I know one of the concerns in, for the nurses is um, a lack of support staff, like LNAs. Certainly. Because the pay is so low and we're on the border, they just, I mean, it can mean a difference of four or five dollars yeah. an hour. That's right. So they just go to Greenfield yeah. or wherever and they work there. And so the stress that that puts on the nursing staff is extreme and so you lose nurses. Right. So, you know, we're in a big hole with that. Absolutely. It's been my experience. Thank you. Thank you for that great feedback. Um, so, yes. Sorry, I was going to add the, the, the other group is uh, primary care providers in terms of trying to get workforce issues, mm -hmm. trying to get people to go into primary care, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, routinely under reimbursed yeah. and with high workload. Um, but hopefully, with this, you know, with the primary care study that shows how much money goes into primary care, if there's actually a, a target that makes sense after that, um, that will hopefully improve reimbursements, which will improve, hopefully, recruitment. Thank you. Okay, so last but not least, we have our Group C. Group C and they um, were given the topic of transparency, but I think you may have expanded it a bit, so <laughs> go ahead. So we, we originally um, decided, we spent the first couple of minutes um, saying how much we didn't need to talk about transparency <laughs> of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, but then actually we did talk a lot about it and we did expand a little bit from that to messaging and then we did very briefly at the end touch on um, price transparency. Um, and I think the latter topic is going to need a, a lot more conversation, but I can sum up what we, what we did. Um, <clears throat> we spent a while talking about perception of um, the Green Mountain Care Board, um, both from the outward facing um, image to uh, physicians, other provider groups, hospitals, and most importantly to the, the Vermont public really, was we, we talked about how there is a, a disconnect between what we think the board wants to be doing and what maybe is messaging and what the average person, and we, we, we struggled a couple of times to describe what's the average person. I think a better term is probably the citizens of Vermont. Um, and so what, what is the image that, that the board projects and, and how is that projected? There was pretty strong agreement that as far as transparency is concerned, um, most of us felt that the website was, was actually excellent and um, I liked your comment about the boards, you know, every board is always told they need to be more transparent. Um, and so maybe the, maybe the reason that that perception exists is because uh, maybe folks aren't accessing the website, maybe that's not the medium that they use to be um, educated, oh, I'm looking for you, yes. Um, maybe that's not the medium they use, maybe they're used to something else, an in-person visit or television, or maybe a website and reading documents isn't, isn't the way that they would learn. Um, we also talked about um, what's the message of the Green Mountain Care Board. Is it, is it cost? Is it quality? Is it improvement? Is it safety? Is it, you know, is, what is it? Is it targeting? Uh, is it clear? Is the message clear? Um, and um, we had a lot of input on that conversation. Um, we didn't really come up with a strong answer, except we all realized that um, you know, the, 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 most of us really want to see, as you articulated, care um, to ourselves and to our families. And that really is what would resonate with most folks rather than targeting cost. Although we are all in this room because we understand that cost is important as well, but how do we message that this is about um, improvement of life for all Vermonters as opposed to a cost initiative? Um, we talked about the 
um, appearance of the Green Mountain Care Board as uh, being a big government, and maybe it doesn't trickle down to the folks at the front line of health care and, and patients and their families. Um, we talked about uh, the historical development of the Green Mountain Care Board and how there's some um, uh, there's been some angst over uh, it, does the board actually represent the populations that are stakeholders in the conversations <coughs> and is what is said at the meetings or expressed in various forums does that actually get to the board and then get acted upon we, we talked about that for quite a while actually um, we realized that this group is a, a stepping stone to closing some of those gaps, particularly around the lack of healthcare participants and patients and families informing the conversation. We talked also about social services, preventive therapy, and um, pharmacy and behavioral health as, as, as uh, participants in that. Um, we we um, talked a little bit about um, cost and um, what does that mean? Does cost create um, better, when you, when you look at cost, does that negatively or positively impact care? Um, I think that it's, it's tough to message that accurately and we struggled with that as well. Uh, reducing cost, we know we need to because it's not sustainable and ultimately high cost will negatively impact access to care, we, we talked about that. Uh, and so we have to be careful about how it's messaged that if we're, a, if the board is about reducing cost, most of us, if we put our individual hat on, would wonder how is that going to impact my own personal care or the care of a sick loved one, or you mentioned someone, you know, your family member with autism or yourself. Um, so there's a, a complexity of, of health care that, that is um, difficult to weed through. Um, we uh, talked about uh, some of the advocacy groups. I thought you made great points about um, certain populations. You mentioned HIV when it comes to transparency. Um, how transparent do we really want to be and are there confidentiality concerns when we're transparent about sensitive topics? Um, one of the things that's the goals is to reduce suicide and substance abuse issues and how I thought of those populations as you were talking about HIV you know how do we how do we manage that how transparent should we be and where's the line between confidentiality and transparency um, <coughs> the um, other thing that we talked about was the board's um, role as far as does it does the board perceive it has less power than it needs? Does the public and do the healthcare members perceive that they have the right power, not enough, too much? That We talked about every different iteration of, of that conversation. Um, lastly, we talked a little bit about um, price transparency, and we didn't get very far in the conversation because we only spent about two minutes doing that, honestly. Um, but I think the general theme, if I can sum that up, was that there is some need for consumers, whether that's prescribers or users of, of health care, to understand what the cost or prices are of what they might pay, but how to operationalize that uh, is very difficult. There are some legal barriers. Uh, sharing of price information is not encouraged. In fact, it's prohibited in certain contracts, um, and, and maybe there will need to be some legislative ways around that. Uh, did I miss anything? anything else? You got it. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, I think you did a great job. I, the, the one thing in talking about uh, getting uh, the general public interested and involved um, was language. I think we all forget when we're in our little professional worlds how specialized our language often is and that we're already at a level where we've been working in our particular field for many years and have a much greater understanding than the people that we're trying to talk to and transmit information to and that we really need to take language and how we use it very seriously in our communications with the public. That's a good reminder. There's a lot of 
acronyms we use. Yeah, so thank you. Well, that was wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking at the time. So I have um, one. We'll, we're, we should open it up to public comment. I don't know if there's any members from the public who need, who would like to comment. I don't. I see a couple. Okay. Um, we will send these notes to you. I also realized we're, we want to share the emails of the groups with you, so you just expect those so that you can have a follow-up conversation within your group. And our next meeting of the general advisory group is September 9th. So um, that is already, should be already on your calendars and it's on our website as well. Um, we will be here in this room again. And please follow up if you have any questions comments, thoughts, please direct them right to me. And um, I believe we can adjourn, Mr. Chair, if you are ready. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you all. Great. Thank you all. Thanks.